Um, this evening we are welcoming uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin uh, to speak uh, at one of the human rights uh, forum. I'm delighted that he's uh, made time in what I know is an extremely busy uh, schedule to spend the evening with us uh, here at Wallen. Uh, Sir Malcolm has had a long and highly distinguished uh, career at the top really of uh, British politics for many years, perhaps more years than he uh, care for me to uh, point out. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Edinburgh, where he studied law. He then uh, undertook postgraduate, a postgraduate degree in political science and practiced as a, a barrister, as an advocate at the Scottish Bar, uh, becoming a Queen's Counsel, a QC, in 1986. He uh, entered Parliament um, and entered government. Um, and uh, I, I think... Um, <coughs> was a minister throughout the period of the Thatcher and Major governments, which I think was uh, the longest uh, uninterrupted period of ministerial office since um, Lord Palmerston. I think you shared that distinction with Ken Clark uh, and perhaps one or two others. He, uh, during the course of his career, held a number of uh, very senior offices. He was Secretary of State uh, for Scotland, Secretary of State for Transport, Secretary of State for Defence, and uh, Foreign Secretary. He is uh, presently the MP for Kensington um, and he chairs the Intelligence uh, and Security Committee uh, of Parliament uh, and, and in uh, that capacity plays a, a, an important, a critical role in the oversight of our intelligence uh, and security services. He is also, uh, I understand from my extensive researches this afternoon, the second cousin once removed uh, of the disc jockey Mark uh, Ronson. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's going to tell us anything about that uh, tonight. More seriously, Sir Markham has recently spoken strongly against uh, what has in effect been the Russian annexation uh, of Crimea. But he's also strongly criticised the Western response, describing I think the implementation of that response as being pathetic and pointing out the same sanctions which have been imposed apply to a grand total of 23 uh, people. Uh, and he recently wrote this in The Guardian, if Vladimir Putin succeeds in redrawing the map of Europe along ethnic grounds, we shall re-enter a phase of European history we thought had ended in 1945. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, Sir Malcolm is here to speak with us uh, tonight and delighted to hand over to him now. Warden, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I must thank uh, the Warden for his extremely kind and generous introduction. Uh, President Lyndon Johnson was once introduced in that way. He said, it's a sort of introduction which his father would have enjoyed and his mother would have believed. Uh, so I am grateful uh, to you. Uh, this evening I am going to speak to you, as you've been informed, on the subject of intelligence and security. Uh, I have to tell you that my very first introduction to the United Kingdom's intelligence agencies. It was not recently, it was when I became a parliamentary undersecretary in the Foreign Office in 1982. And at that time, as far as I was aware, I had no contact with the intelligence agencies. But on my very first day in office, my private secretary came to me and said, Minister, uh, there's a gentleman from MI6. He says he must see you, uh, very urgent, very confidential. I'm not allowed to be present. Uh, will you see him? I said, yes, please, show him in, uh, thinking this is real James Bond stuff. Um, an unsmiling figure entered my office, and I invited him to sit down. I said, I understand you want to speak to me. What, what can I do to help you? And without any explanation, any preliminary remarks, not even the glimmer of a smile, he said, Minister, it's my job to indoctrinate you. <laughs> this is the middle of the Cold War, and I thought at that time it was the Koreans and the Chinese and the Russians who went into things like that. But in fact, what he meant was to explain the Official Secrets Act and require <coughs> me to sign it. And by doing that, I was indoctrinated. A term of art, but this clot never thought to explain to me before he told me what he was about to do, uh, what it would involve. Uh, some of you, many of you, I suspect, uh, have seen the, the latest Bond movie, Skyfall. Uh, well, I'm in it. Uh, that is the truth, though I have to confess it's not the whole truth. Uh, you will recall that Judy Dench plays the head of MI6. 
Uh, and Ray Fiennes plays a gentleman called Mallory, who is described as the chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee, and that's me. <laughs> so when I heard that, I said, well, why did they need Ray Fiennes? I'd have been quite happy to play myself. Uh, but then I discovered he gets shot in the shoulder, and of course, eventually, he takes over Judy Dench's job as the head of MI6. And I swear, this is true what I'm about to say, that uh, several weeks after I'd seen the bill, uh, when we'd uh, had an evidence session with the current head of MI6, who's called C, not M, uh, at the end of the session, I had to say to him, thank you very much, please don't worry, I'm not after your job. <laughs> I, I got what can only be described as a rictus smile in response. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do now is turn, if I may, to the subject matter. The intelligence agencies in the internet age, public servants or public threat. I begin, I begin by observing that intelligence agencies in any free society should not be treated with unqualified enthusiasm. Firstly, they are secretive and must remain so as regards a very high proportion of their capabilities and activities. And this inevitably makes it much more difficult for Parliament, the press, and civil society as a whole in holding them to account than with any other part of government or of the public sector. Furthermore, in, in order to fulfill their statutory responsibilities and to serve the public interest, they must be given local, lawful authority to carry out deeds which, if carried out by any other citizen, by you or me, would constitute criminal offences. They have legal authority in the right circumstances to hack computers, intercept phones, or break into people's homes to plant bugs. In any democracy, that should make all of us feel uncomfortable. For the public to accept such powers in a country such as ours, there needs to be proper oversight of the intelligence agencies. But it is unavoidable, and this is the crunch, it's unavoidable that that oversight can only be exercised by those people who have been permitted to have access to the secret information that the agencies gather. Apart from senior ministers, small handful of public servants, that access is in fact limited to the quasi-judicial intelligence commissioners and to the Intelligence and Security Committee, which I chair. If the public are to be supportive of the work of the intelligence agencies, they must not only have trust in them, but they must also have trust in the independence and integrity of those who carry out the oversight task. Now, some of the secrecy which used to surround the agencies has gone. Today, the intelligence chiefs are questioned in front of the TV cameras, their names are known, as are their places of work, in Vauxhall, in Thames House, and Cheltenham, to a degree that would have been inconceivable even 30 years ago, when the governments of the day refused to even acknowledge that the agencies existed. But although there has been much greater openness, <clears throat> there needs also to be continuing examination as to whether transparency can be further enhanced and secrecy modified without harm to their operational effectiveness. Now, during these years of increasing openness, the priorities of the agencies and the technical capabilities available to them, not only to them, but also to those who would do us harm, have changed out of all recognition. The advent of the internet age and its implications for the world of intelligence is perhaps the profoundest change of all. For many years, the primary purpose of our secret services, this is during the Cold War period, was to find out the secrets of hostile governments and their leaders, to protect the secrets of our own government, and to guard against internal subversion. Espionage and counter-espionage were the classic priorities. Activity of this kind is as old as the hills. Parliament first established an account to properly fund the collection of secret intelligence in 1689. In 1807, when Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I were sat on Napoleon's barge at Tilsit, negotiating a joint invasion of British India, a Russian aristocrat recruited by the British Secret Service and stationed in the water underneath the barge listened in on their conversation 
and reported it to London. In the 20th century, intelligence capabilities and those of our adversaries were revolutionized by developments in signals intelligence technology. Signals intelligence is not new. In 1917, British intelligence, this is true, this is well documented, fam famously intercepted a telegram communicated via undersea cables from the German foreign minister, Arthur Zimmerman, to Mexico, to the Mexican government, enjoining the Mexicans to join the central powers in exchange after German victory in the First World War that they would get the recovery of their lost territories in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The Mexicans, very wisely, were not impressed and did not join Germany in that war. Now, during the Cold War, despite continuing developments in technology, spying was still largely conducted at a state-to-state -state level. The IRA campaign in Northern Ireland on the, and on the British mainland was the one significant exception. After the Soviet Union collapsed, collapsed, the spies were brought in from the cold. The resources and manpower of the agencies were substantially scaled down. Then the tragic events of the 11th of September of 9-11 in New York and the London bombings in 2005 changed everything. They brought home the realization that rather than hostile governments, international terrorist organizations now posed the most serious threat to the safety of the public. Furthermore, as we found in 2005, many of these terrorists who had, uh, had not come from abroad, many of them sadly were British citizens so alienated from our society and values that they were prepared not only to blow themselves up, but to take with them as many of their fellow citizens as they could. Over the last decade or so, Western intelligence agencies have therefore had to make international counter-terrorism <coughs> rather than espionage or counter-espionage their major concern. Espionage is still there, but it's counter-terrorism that is the major concern of all three of the uh, UK agencies. At the heart of the development of the international terror networks that most threaten our safety is the rise and spread of the internet. Global terrorists, how do they communicate? They communicate globally. And in practice, this means communicating online, using email, social messaging, peer-to-peer -peer sharing sites, shit chat rooms, webcams, online gaming platforms, mobile applications, and a whole host of other media. It allows extremists to disseminate propaganda, attract and radicalize sympathizers, and ultimately to organize and prepare acts of terror without ever having to meet face to face. Just as many millions of Britons use the internet to stay in touch with people in the UK and abroad, so sadly many young Britons already radicalized or at the risk of radicalization are in regular contact with people in remote, distant, hostile, or ungoverned territories. One consequence, of course, has been the jihadi volunteers who have gone to Syria. And even if only a small proportion, a very small proportion, of those who have gone return to Britain to cause harm, the training in terror techniques that they have received and the likelihood of them being further radicalized and brutalized by their experiences poses a very severe threat the security of the British public. In decades <coughs> past, such dangerous plotting would be countered, would have been countered by traditional means, conducting surveillance on people's or properties, installing bugs to eavesdrop on conversations, or talking to your informants or your agents. These approaches are still relevant, but they do not deal entirely with the new evolving picture. We have to come to terms with the world in which potential terrorists today may have no leaders, where they communicate using sophisticated <coughs> encryption technology and are just as much in contact through the internet with sympathizers in Yemen or Pakistan as they are with those in the United Kingdom. Now, most people recognize that if actual or potential terrorists are to be apprehended, there is likely to be a considerably greater degree of intrusion into the privacy of the public by the security services than was required when our enemies were restricted to foreign governments. Because of this, some people have become increasingly anxious 
that our intelligence agencies are using the extensive technological capabilities now available through the internet to impose general surveillance of the public. This, it is alleged, has not been declared or approved by Parliament and may be illegal. It is, of course, not surprising when you think about it that the intelligence agencies may possess capabilities about which the public have not been fully aware. This should not be controversial in itself. Any intelligence agency would be rendered obsolete were all of its capabilities to become common knowledge. For a few of the critics, their concern is influenced by their presumption that the intelligence agencies have some sinister intent and are indifferent to the loss of privacy that their activities entail. Most, however, to be fair, who express concern are much more reasonable. They acknowledge that the agencies seek to operate within the law, but they question whether any system of monitoring that is not targeted exclusively at known or suspected terrorists, they question whether that is either justifiable or necessary. These anxieties have, of course, been brought to a head in the debate surrounding the leaking of stolen intelligence documents by Edward Snowden. Snowden downloaded 1.2 million US top secret documents, including 58,000 relating to GCHQ. There have been allegations against GCHQ, questioning, for example, whether they have introduced a system of general surveillance without proper authority or disclosure. As the parliamentary body responsible for overseeing MI5, MI6 and GCHQ, I and my colleagues on the Intelligence Committee have the responsibility to investigate these allegations. We have begun, indeed, we had our first evidence session this morning. We have begun a major and unprecedented inquiry into privacy and security involving our intelligence agencies. We have already received, over the last few weeks, written evidence, both from the agencies and from private citizens, from lobbies and from NGOs. <coughs> We will be taking oral evidence, some of it in public session, throughout the next few months. It's against this background that I address this evening the central issue. Are our intelligence agencies public servants, or are they a public threat? And in doing so, I will seek to address the following four central questions. First of all, are MI6, MI5, and GCHQ subject to the law, or are they permitted to act outside the law? Secondly, are our intelligence agencies subject to satisfactory independent oversight in all that they do? Thirdly, even if the agencies do comply with the law, is that law fit for purpose? And might in any event the law under which they operate enable them to act in ways which are against the public interest? And fourthly, is there significant scope to increase the accountability of the agencies to the public and to Parliament by greater transparency without doing serious damage to their operational effectiveness. Now these are just some of the issues being addressed by the ISC in its current investigation into privacy and security. That inquiry will take several months to enable us to reach firm conclusions. But I wish to share with you this evening our current thoughts and priorities. On the first question, it is worth reminding ourselves, that's, are they subject to the law? On the first question, it's worth reminding ourselves that British intelligence agencies did not have any act of parliament to control their activities until as late as the 1990s. Only in the last 25 years have they operated under acts of parliament under statute. Before then, they were, of course, answerable to ministers but only in an ill-defined and private <coughs> manner. It was only as the Cold War came to an end that the agencies were placed on a statutory footing for the first time. The 1989 Security Services Act for MI5 and the 1994 Intelligence Services Act for MI6 and GCH2 enshrined their responsibilities and protections in law. Since 1994, they have had to operate within a very strict legal framework. They must first of all comply with three basic guiding principles. First of all, their actions must be for a specific lawful purpose. Secondly, their actions must be necessary. 
And third, their actions must be proportionate. And by proportionate, that means that they must be able to reconcile what is lawful with what is necessary. Unless they can meet all these, not just some, all these requirements, any use of their capabilities would be illegal. None of the agencies are free to use their powers indiscriminately. They are permitted to exercise their functions only in pursuit of the specific objectives set out for them in the Act of Parliament, it's the Intelligence Services Act. And these are three purposes, one of which at least has to be fulfilled if they are to be acting lawfully. First, it must be in the interest of national security. The second possibility would be in support of the prevention or detection of serious crime. And third, for the economic well-being of the United Kingdom, but where state security is involved. If an employee of any agency, or the agency itself, uses any of these powers for any other reasons than the three I've mentioned, he or she is committing a crime and is liable to be prosecuted. Now, in addition to the legislation which set out the agency's statutory objectives, the agencies must also comply in everything they do with the 1998 Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act imposes a set of human rights obligations expressed in general terms. This includes an individual right to privacy, which may only be interfered with to protect the safety of society as a whole. In order to comply with the Human Rights Act, the two, year 2000 Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, known as often as REPA, outlines the detailed procedures with which the agencies must comply when engaging in intrusive activity. And part one of that act outlines the requirements for a warrant application to the Secretary of State or other authorization in order to monitor the contents of any communication. Now these applications are no mere formality. I've seen the submissions, indeed, when I was Foreign Secretary, I received them. The agencies must make a detailed case, <coughs> normally running to several pages in each case. Warrants are subject to retrospective examination by the <coughs> intelligence commissioners, who are or have been very senior judges, to check that applications are lawful and that the subsequent use of any warrant was consistent with those applications. So in answer to the first question I raised, there is clearly a substantial legal framework within which our intelligence agencies must operate if they are not to fall foul of the law. That brings me to my second central question. Is there proper independent oversight to ensure that the agencies observe the law and act in the public interest? And again, I have to say, before 1994, there wasn't any oversight at all of an independent kind. To meet that requirement, the 1994 Act also established both the quasi-judicial commissioners that I've mentioned and the Intelligence and Security Committee, which I chair, which is a parliamentary committee of nine members, bipartisan, from all parties, to provide accountability that would ensure that the agencies compl complied with their obligations. Last year, at the early stages of the Snowden affair, many were deeply concerned by suggestions in The Guardian that GCHQ might have deliberately attempted to circumvent its legal obligations by soliciting the NSA, the American uh, National Security Agency, to provide them with intelligence material about British citizens. It was alleged that they were unable to obtain uh, because of the constraints of British law. That was the allegation. As the parliamentary body responsible for overseeing GCHQ, it was our duty to investigate these claims free from prior assumptions. who were very serious claims, because if they had been true, it would have gone to the very heart of GCHQ's integrity that they were deliberately trying to avoid their legal responsibilities. So we investigated these matters using the substantial new powers which we had obtained under the 2013 Justice and Security Act. We scrutinized GCHQ's access to the content of communications, the legal framework governing that access, and the arrangements GCHQ has with its overseas counterparts for sharing such information. We didn't just take the evidence they gave us orally, we looked at their files, and we have access to all their secret files under our new powers. And we were able to establish that in each and every case 
where GCHQ sought information from the United States, a warrant for interception signed by a minister was actually already in place in accordance with the legal safeguards contained in REPA. So on that particular occasion, uh, we were able to reach a very clear conclusion. I have to say, and I say it quite openly, unfortunately, the ISC has not always been able to report its conclusions with the same level of confidence. Until last year, the ISC's powers were very severely restricted. Upon becoming chairman of the ISC after the 2010 general election, I and my colleagues initiated a review into the way the ISC then operated and the legislative framework within which it did so. That review confirmed the inadequacies in the ISC's powers at that time. Two issues stood out above all others as grounds for deep concern regarding the committee's ability to reassure Parliament and the public that they could be confident with the conclusions of the ISC's reports on the agencies. Firstly, under existing legislation, when conducting an investigation into agency activity, the committee could only, under the previous Act, request the necessary documents and primary evidence from the agencies. We could request it, but we had no legal right to insist on it being provided. And we could not be confident that any information provided by the agencies was complete. Now, I don't suggest that in the past the agencies purposely obfuscated or tried to hinder our investigations, but an ISC investigation did not impose upon them the same statutory demands to provide all the relevant material as would be required, for example, for a court case. The agencies themselves have acknowledged that in the past they did not always identify documents for the ISC with the same rigour as they would if required to do so by a court order. And this vulnerability was exposed during a court case in relation to allegations of rendition and treatment of detainees. The ISC had published a report into the allegations, this is uh, about uh, 10 years ago, the ISC had published a report into allegations, but when the case went to trial before a judge, further documentation emerged to which the ISC had not been given access. This did serious damage to confidence in the ISC's ability to conduct their investigations with the necessary rigour. So that was one of the first of the two most important failings. Secondly, while the ISC, since its formation in 1995, was formally responsible for scrutinising the agency's policy, resources and administration, it had been given under the Act no comparable responsibility for scrutinising agency operations. And operations are, of course, <clears throat> the most sensitive and important part of the agency's activities and are what give rise from time to time to most public concern, as we have seen with the Snowden allegations in regard to GCHQ. <clears throat> in practice, the ISC over the years was able to oversee many, aspect, many aspects of agency operations, but these were restricted to investigating a specific event at the request of the Prime Minister, such as the London bombings of 2005, or allegations such as rendition that had surfaced in the media. The ISC at that time did not have the statutory right either to know about the operational capabilities of the agencies in any systematic way, or the right to investigate operations at its own discretion. We therefore, some years ago, this is about 2005, 2006, I'm sorry, forgive me, 2010, 2011, uh, we strongly recommended in 2011 uh, fundamental reforms to the government. The government accepted our proposals and Parliament approved them in last year's Justice and Security Act. The reforms that have now been implemented to the ISC in the Act constituted a radical transformation of the Committee's powers. The ISC now has statutory responsibility for the retrospective oversight of MI6, MI5 and GCHQ operations for the first time. We now have the statutory right to ascertain in detail the agency's capabilities in a systematic as opposed to an ad hoc manner. The agencies are now reporting to us on a quarterly basis with detailed information on their operational, on all their operational activities 
in the preceding uh, period. GCHQ has been providing us with information on the full spectrum, the full spectrum of their capabilities. The ISC now also has statutory authority under the Act to require, as opposed to request, all the information, including the raw intelligence it requires, in order to conduct its investigations. The most radical change is that, and this is not, uh, not in statute, but it's now implemented, the most radical change is that the ISC's own staff, our, our own staff now have the right and are using it to go into the intelligence agency's offices, access the files, and together with agency staff to decide the files that will be given to the committee as opposed to the, having the agencies themselves making that decision on our behalf. Now, this is the first time that external investigators from the ISC have been able to enjoy such direct access to such sensitive material. There have been further, uh, further, further important reforms on top of the ones that I have mentioned. The ISC is now also part of Parliament. Before it was a committee of parliamentarians, but not part of the parliamentary structure. Its staff, our staff, will shortly become parliamentary staff. We now report directly to Parliament, and Parliament, not the Prime Minister, now has the last word on the committee's membership. The committee chairman will no longer be appointed by the Prime Minister, but decided by the members of the committee as to whom they think would be the best person for the job, whether from a government or opposition party. Last but not least, the committee's budget this year will be doubled to around £1.3 million pounds a year. The number of its staff will rise commensurately, and this is a significant increase in resources at a time of severe financial constraint. Now, these changes were initiated by the Intelligence Committee and approved by Parliament before the Snowden story broke. The timing, however, has actually been very fortunate. We have already used these new powers, as I've mentioned, in our investigation into the PRISM allegations, and we've been using them this year into the investigation we've carried out into the murder of Drummer Lee Rigby, uh, that's a report which will be published later this year, and we're using them in our current privacy and security inquiry. So I now turn to my third question. Even if the intelligence agencies do act in an entirely legal manner, does the existing law enable them nevertheless to act in ways which are in practice against the public interest? particularly in regard to the privacy of the citizens in this internet age. Now, this question goes to the very heart of our current inquiry on privacy and security. And for that reason, I cannot anticipate what our conclusions will be, but I am able to share some of the major issues which we will be examining and taking evidence of. And these will include, and these are largely the issues that have been raised in the written submissions we have received from NGOs, from lobbies, from private citizens, from academics. We've examined all the concerns they've expressed. And so the issues that I'm about to read uh, are very much the ones that they have said they are concerned about. Is there a balance that has to be made between privacy and security as regards the interception of communications? Or will it always be the case, as some argue? that the security of the public will itself be weakened if individual privacy is compromised. Uh, secondly, should interception of communications by intelligence agencies be permitted only in regard to those individuals who are suspected of terrorist or criminal activities, or should some bulk collection of data from a wider section of the public be permissible if it is done for the sole purpose of preventing terrorism and serious crime? Thirdly, is there credible evidence as to the extent to which such bulk collection of data has made a significant contribution to the detection and prevention of terrorism and serious crime? Fourthly, is the distinction in the legislation between the safeguards and procedures that must be applied as between communications data and the content of emails and the like still valid and persuasive? Fifthly, are the different requirements in the current legislation for interception by intelligence agencies of communications entirely within the United Kingdom as compared to those to or from foreign addresses still valid? Sixthly, are different legal standards 
<clears throat> as regards intersection of communications of British citizens living outside the United Kingdom compared to those who live within, justifiable. Now this is far from an exhaustive list, but it will enable you to feel, I hope, the unprecedented breadth of our current inquiry, uh, and uh, that will, I hope, be of reassurance. Finally, there is my fourth question for this evening. Is there scope for significantly greater transparency with regard to the capabilities and activities of the intelligence agencies without damaging their operational effectiveness? Now, these two uh, are matters that we are considering in our current inquiry. And let me, as I did a few moments ago, uh, share with you the sort of issues that we are pursuing, also issues raised with us by many of the academics, NGOs, lobbies, and others who have commented. Firstly, should the government explain much more clearly the legal basis for the intelligence agency's activities, including any bulk collection of data? Secondly, is it sensible or can it on some occasions be counterproductive for the government to persist in a do not confirm, do not deny policy to all intelligence queries? Thirdly, should the existence of certain agency capabilities that have been widely reported in the press be acknowledged if they are true, when doing so might help reassure the public as to the unreliability of other allegations? Fourthly, cannot much more be published as to the procedures that have to be gone through to get permission from the Secretary of State or other senior authority before interception is permitted? These are not exclusively or exhaustive examples, but these are the core of what we are seeking to establish. And it has been said that democracy is government by explanation. This might be true in respect of our intelligence agencies to a greater extent than has so far been assumed. Let me make some final points, if I may. The distinction between intelligence agencies and democracies and those in authoritarian systems is crucially important. Intelligence agencies exist, of course, in every state, both democratic and authoritarian, throughout the world. While they share certain things in common, we must never lose sight of the differences. Intelligence agencies within authoritarian systems, dictatorships or the like, may wish to protect the public from terrorism, as we do, and some types of serious crime, as we do. But their primary objective, their intelligence agencies, is the preservation of the regime they serve. Unfortunately, the insidious use of language such as mass surveillance and Orwellian by many of Mr. Snowden's supporters to describe the actions of Western agencies blurs, I would suggest unforgivably, the distinction between a system that uses the state to protect the people and one that uses the state to protect itself against the people. It is ironic that Mr. Snowden, in the name of privacy, and the rule of law chose China and Russia from which to launch his attack on the United States. Some people in Britain have pointed to the different reactions of the press and the public to the Snowden revelations in the United States and Germany as evidence of some kind of uniquely British complacency. But this is to ignore the considerable political and historic differences within the free world. For example, some cite President Obama's response to the NSA allegations as an example for the United Kingdom to follow. But President Obama's most substantial promise has been to do away with what is now admitted in America, the NSA, the National Security Agency's own central database of American citizens' telephone communications. And the President has agreed that, they sh that agencies will be required not to hold that information themselves, but to access the information they need from the phone companies who have it. That is, as it happens, precisely the situation in the United Kingdom already at present. We have never had uh, an agency-owned database in the first place. So that is why there is no example here for, for the United Kingdom to follow. People also cite Germany as an example of how we should respond. Because clearly, the concern in Germany in Parliament and the press, amongst the public, has been much more as a result of Snowden, not simply because of the allegations of Angela Merkel's phone being tapped, also the wider issues. 
But for many Germans, reference to interception by intelligence agencies reminds them inevitably of their Nazi and Stasi experience. For the British, rightly or wrongly, the comparable historic memory in Bletchley Park is Bletchley Park, which shortened the war and ensured the preservation of our liberty. So I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm simply saying there's a different historical experience. And the agencies in the United Kingdom are never seen as sinister by the vast majority of the public. But that should not make us complacent, but it is a valid distinction. We all live in a world in which there are occasional paradoxes. When a terrorist atrocity occurs, as for example with drummer Lee Rigby, the majority of the public tends to ask, why did the agencies know so little about those who were responsible? When, however, the surveillance activities of the agencies are revealed, a smaller but vocal number of people tend to ask why they need to know so much. We need to do a better job of recognizing the competing demands we place upon the agencies and do more to establish a consensus, if we can, as to how these demands can be reconciled. Our intelligence agencies are not and do not wish to be all-seeing nor all-hearing. Their capabilities have been designed to pursue their lawful, narrowly defined objectives. Let me conclude, therefore, by going back to the original question, public servants are a public threat, the agencies. True public servants, true public servants, operate with noble motivations, lawful authority, and subject to rigorous oversight. These are the values that distinguish public servants from a public threat. That is how those who work for our intelligence agencies certainly see themselves. That is, seems to be how most of the public see them. That has been my own experience seeing them at work over a number of years. It's in all our interests that that should remain their justified reputation in the internet age. Thank you very much indeed.